In only two centuries, Islam had extended its reach from Spain all the way to the edge of India. It took nearly a year to travel from one end of the Arab Empire to the other. At its heart was a fabled city of wealth. It was called Baghdad. The palaces of ancient Baghdad have been lost over the centuries. But in its glory, it rivaled ancient Athens or Rome. It was a magnificent architectural achievement, the pride of Islam in a new age. One visitor left this account. All the exquisite neighborhoods covered with parks, gardens, villas, and beautiful promenades are filled with bazaars and finely built mosques and baths. They stretch for miles on... Now, you are responsible for public hygiene, you are responsible for the marketplace, you are responsible for goods being sold in the marketplace. All of those require some basic elementary sciences. This new civilization, having a need for science, really stems from the need to run that empire. The best minds rose to the call. The finest were welcomed at a center of scholarship Baghdad's renowned House of Wisdom. It was a magnet for scholars and intellectuals who came um, and worked in the academies. There were public libraries associated with the palace, and scholars came from all over the empire. And there were scholars from Iran, there were scholars from Byzantium who came. Some were Christian, some were Muslim, some were Jews. And all of these different the sort of threads of human knowledge came together in the city of Baghdad. So uh, the net effect of this is that you've got uh, human uh, individuals from radically different cultural traditions being thrown into the same crucible. The challenge that greeted these scholars was daunting. The great works of the ancients had to be transformed into a wholly new body of knowledge. Competition for jobs developed within a new intellectual elite. And from there on, every single scientist is competing for that job. They were competing among themselves almost just, just in the same way that modern, modern bureaucrats and modern academicians will fight among themselves. Scholars were dispatched across the empire to locate as many ancient texts as possible. The first international scientific venture in history. Unlike their Christian counterparts, Muslim thinkers saw no insurmountable contradiction between their faith and the laws governing the natural world. So they embraced Aristotle and Plato, writers the Christian church considered blasphemous. So this is the time when we begin to see scientists, bureaucrats, what have you, going and seeking from whatever civilization that had any sciences before, be it the Greek, be it the Indian, being the Persian, and so on. From the Hindus came mathematical concepts that guide us today. It was the scholars of the House of Wisdom who developed the system of Arabic numerals, still in use. It is they who translated and transformed the writings of the Greeks and made a gift of them to the modern Western world. The Renaissance had its beginnings in Baghdad. They managed to assimilate quite a lot of the rich legacy of the Hellenistic world, translated into Arabic initially, which was then made available to all other participants in uh, the new Islamic civilization. Arabic emerges as the language of learning throughout the region. This is a very significant development in human intellectual history. 
Having amassed the knowledge, the Muslims now began to challenge it. This was perhaps their most important contribution. The scientific process was born. They wanted to know why a very intelligent Greek scientist, whose text they were just admiring and they were verifying it, why would he make a mistake in the first place? So they began to dig, was it because he didn't have the right instruments or is it because he didn't have the right methodology to use the instruments for the verifications of observation? It is this spirit. You see, the spirit of questioning, the spirit of saying that we have to build science constantly on a systematic, consistent basis where we make a physical proposition of how the universe ought to be run and the mathematical representation of that physical universe ought to match. Now you begin to have what I call the birth of the new Islamic science. Algebra and trigonometry, engineering and astronomy, Countless disciplines integral to our lives today trace their roots to Islamic scientists. More surprising, perhaps, were their innovations in medicine. At a time when Europeans were praying to the bones of their saints to cure their illnesses, Muslim physicians developed an innovative theory that disease was transmitted through tiny airborne organisms, the precursor to the study of germs. They determined that sick patients should be quarantined and then treated. This is the basis of the institution most fundamental to medicine today, the hospital. Funded mainly through religious endowments, Muslim hospitals had separate wards for patients suffering from different kinds of disease. Even mental illness was treated. Their studies of anatomy were so sophisticated that they remained in use by Muslim and European physicians for 600 years. Muslim scientists were especially intrigued by light, lenses, and the physiology of the human eye. The father of optics was a Muslim named Ibn al-Haytham. His work with lenses eventually led to the invention of the modern camera. He produced the first treatise that ventured to explain how the eye actually sees. A thousand years before the West dared to take up the practice, Muslim doctors were removing cataracts surgically, clearing them from the eye with a hollow needle. But for all this knowledge to transform and illuminate an empire, it had to be copied and shared across a hundred different cities in the Islamic world. For this, there was a new invention one that is still fundamental to learning and knowledge today. Paper. <laughs> 